I was on my front lawn of my parents' suburban house uh, in Kings Norton, Birmingham, and I'd lie on a particular part of a lawn which was shaded from the street lamp by a tree. I remember our next door neighbour coming along looking at me on the ground saying, what are you doing there, David? And I said, I'm looking at the stars. And she said, oh, if you've seen one star, you've seen them all, which is not true, as most people watching this, I hope, will realise. If I showed you a picture of this cluster, is there any chance at all you'd recognise it? Not a hope. <laughs> Open clusters, they're the scatterings of stars, they're very uninspiring to look at in some ways, and they tend not to have distinguishing features. There's a few I could recognise, like the Pleiades, for example, uh, the star clusters, open clusters that everyone recognises, but most of them, you really don't stand much chance. The winter sky from Britain is fantastic when you get a good clear night. Even in Birmingham when I was a lad, I, could, I found I could see quite a lot. I taught myself, I had a copy of Norton Star Atlas. Here's the constellation of Gemini. And one of my favourite objects to try and find was M35. It's hard to spot with the naked eye, but there's a line of stars at the right-hand end of Gemini. And you just go up from there and find M35. And with my trusty 7x50 binoculars, I used to spend time looking for it. And the best way with handheld binoculars is to lie on the ground and look upwards. There are umpteen open clusters in the Messier catalogue. Um, this one just happens to stand out a little bit, at least in my mind, because it's actually one of the first papers I studied when I was a graduate student was actually about this cluster. So it actually came out in the journals in 1989. I was already starting to get interested in studying the motions of objects uh, within galaxies and within clusters of stars. And it was a very new idea what these guys were doing. So the various things that astronomers want to measure about the properties of objects. One is they want to measure their masses. It's kind of a classic thing to measure. When you've discovered an object, you want to find out what its mass is. Basically, you look at the orbits of stars, and from that, you can actually figure out how much gravity there is holding anything together, and hence what the mass is. But there's a famous ambiguity, which is that you can trade off between how the stars are orbiting, whether they're on very radial orbits or very circular orbits, and how the mass is distributed. And typically the only thing you can measure is the line of sight velocities of stars, how fast they're moving along the line of sight, because that you can measure from the Doppler shift, that's something we can measure. What these guys did was they actually measured proper motion. So instead of measuring line of sight velocities, they actually measured the movements of stars across the line of sight. You take a picture of a star cluster, you wait a decade or so, and then you take another picture and you see how far the stars have moved. And because star clusters, unlike galaxies, are relatively nearby, even over a sort of decade time scale, that's enough time to see stars move by a, a reasonable amount. In the first case, where you're just measuring line of sight motions, all you've got is kind of one component of the speed, how fast it's moving that way. When you can measure things on the sky, you've got two components, because you can measure how fast they're moving that way and how fast they're moving that way. And it turns out that information is enough to lift this ambiguity. that You can measure both what the distribution of orbits within the object are and also what the mass of the object is. And so because it's a relatively well-known cluster, it's in the Messier catalogue and so on, it means people have been taking photographs of it for, at that point, getting on for 100 years. So this was the first time someone had really done a very systematic analysis of this to actually measure the mass of the star cluster. Before this measurement was made, one of the sort of unsolved problems was, or unknown questions, was whether there was dark matter associated with star clusters. You know, dark matter is this extra mass that you find in galaxies and so on that seems to permeate the universe. And what they were able to show is that, at least for this star cluster, the mass you measure from these rather clever dynamical measurements is exactly the same as the mass you'd infer just by adding up all the stars. So in this case, there's no extra mass. All the mass seems to be in stars. Mike, it looks a very technical paper. There's lots of equations and not many pretty pictures of stars. Scary, huh? <laughs> M35 for me was just one which was moderately easy to find. Um, a little bit of a challenge from Birmingham, but with these binoculars I could find it, and it's around a convenient time of year because winter evenings are dark, you don't have to stay up late. If your parents are wanting to send you to bed, you can still go outside in the evening and do some observing. It's also fairly high in the sky. If you wanted to start looking for Messier objects, I mean, the easiest one to find is the Pleiades. I don't know why it's even in his catalogue. It's obviously not a comet. As far as the run-of-the-mill fainter Messier objects go, M35 is not a bad one to try and find. If you can find that, you can scan up and down the Milky Way, and there's so many other clusters nearby in that region. It's a really good time of year to be out if it's not too cold. It's fun, it's nice and peaceful to be out there finding your way around the sky. Once you've found your way around the sky with a naked eye, the next step is to find all the details that are there that you can see with a pair of binoculars. It's very, very rewarding. The stars become your friends. Um, oh, we're sounding like nerds now. We've got no friends apart from the stars. <laughs>
signal. So on this particular telescope, I take hours and hours and hours over multiple nights. This thing has probably taken over oh, probably about four or five nights. This mount actually counteracts the rotation